Hey everyone, welcome back to Adobe Live. I'm surrounded by some very talented people. Aww. Welcome, talented people. Welcome to Adobe Live. Thank you. So I'm surrounded by the new Adobe Creative Residence. And chat, if you have no idea what the Creative Residency is, I have Anna over here to give a little bit of a, a spiel, a little introduction. Hello. Welcome, Anna. <laughs> Here's the mic. <laughs> so Adobe launched a program that basically gives us the opportunity, any creatives, there are many different disciplines, to work on a project for the entirety of a year. And we basically further our career through the project. And it's fantastic. We all love it, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And you're just starting. So there's still a lot to Very learn beginning. and explore. <laughs> so it starts in May and it goes for? An entire year. One yeah. year. <laughs> cool. So you're stuck with these residents for a year. They're going to make some amazing stuff. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and good. maybe we can all introduce, I'll take this from you, yeah, uh, your work because you all cover kind of a vast majority of creative spheres. So we're going to start with Andrea. Hi and guys. I have her work on the screen, so check it out. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea Hawk. I'm a UX UI designer. So I focus on things like branding, usability, and functionality of like apps and websites. Uh, so my, my project is all about really embracing the future and innovation, uh, particularly what we call IoT, or Internet of Things. So that's basically the connection between the Internet and all of our everyday objects, allowing us to communicate with them. Um, so I'm going to be creating a series of screens based on automation and how they can improve the human experience. Um, so I'm hoping it'll get everybody excited about automation thinking about what they can change in their own lives, and just excited about experience design and its role in society. Nice. So are you still very much just exploring Definitely. these touch points? Because yeah. I see some like, maybe some weather stuff, yeah. or yeah. electricity and energy stuff. Mm -hmm. so maybe cool. like agriculture, oh, yeah. the office space, um, and at home, you know, all the areas that we can use automation. Yeah, I want to see some automation for pets. That'd be cool. <laughs> I want to know what's up with my yeah. dog <laughs> at all times, exactly. Yes. Cool, awesome. Andrea, thanks so much for giving your spiel. Uh, we're going to go on to the next. This is Aaron. I'm going to hand you the mic. Hey, guys. I'm Aaron. <laughs> I'm uh, based here in New York. I'm coming from a fashion background. And I think what always interested me in fashion was my, I guess, ability to create specific worlds of style. And I, I saw that start to inform my hobbies, which then expanded the scope of my work from fashion uh, into still lives, uh, which led me to food photography. So my residency project is creating a digital space called Hungry Boy that will explore <laughs> food and food culture uh, through photo and video projects, uh, using New York as a playground to reflect culture um, and focus on the why and the how of what we eat. Yeah, so are you the hungry boy? I'm always the hungry boy. Because <laughs> I thought this cat was the hungry boy. Oh no, it's definitely me. No. The cat is. I also see a pun. Hunger Games? Yes. <laughs> there you go. Cool, that's awesome. I love seeing your fashion background kind of shining through this very editorial uh, experience. Thanks. Yeah, awesome, Erin. Thanks so much for sharing. Take this from you. All right, we're going over to Anna, who Yo, did our I'm intro. Back. What's up, Anna? <laughs> a fellow illustrator. Big Indeed, fan. yes. I am an illustrator, uh, so it makes sense that I would make a children's book. Uh, so that's my project for the year. Uh, it's kind of a two-parter. So the first is a children's book altogether. I love doing really bright, fun, colorful things, uh, whimsical styles. And so the book's going to be very much based in these two children's imagination. It's going to be very fun. Uh, there will be animals involved. <laughs> is he a good boy? Uh, he's a good boy. <laughs> yeah, it's actually Sirius Black, but in his dog form. Oh, I see. <laughs> it was for Harry Potter very prompt week. Good boy. Uh, but with this book, there uh, it's called Scaredy Cat, so there will be a cat hidden on every page, and I'm super excited to do that. I have the book dummy ready. Um, but the second part of my project is that I'm going to be talking with other illustrators and writers, and I'm going to either do a podcast or a live stream, we're still working on it, uh, to discuss what makes a children's book successful, whether yeah. it's monetarily or with awards or whatever, you know, what makes a children's book really good. Because this is a new avenue for me, like I'm getting into children's book right now and I'm hoping to come out of this with a wonderful career of children's book illustration and writing. And so... I want to know how to get there, and I want to bring you on that journey, basically, with me. Yeah, that's so valuable, yeah. and I feel like this live stream is a great 
first foray into <laughs> your live stream or your podcast. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I'm going to talk to you all about everything. <laughs> what can we <laughs> Yes. Cool. Awesome. Yes. I love your illustrations. Thank awesome you. children's lit style. Right. Yes. Yeah, very fun. I just love drawing cute things. <laughs> Can't stop. Honestly. <laughs> awesome. Anna, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate Kathy. it. All right. We're going to go over to Laura. Hello. We're very close to each other. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you take the wheel. Yeah. Kind of explain what you're doing here. Um, so normally people know me for being a portrait and especially self-portrait photographer. Right. Mm -hmm. And this awesome. year, this is not me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, and this year I want to do something that's inspired from a project that I did um, many years ago uh, or like during the last years where I was taking photos of people on the streets that I never like people that I never met before right. and during that project I realized that the older the people were that I asked the more likely they said I don't want to be in a photograph oh. because I'm not beautiful anymore and that made me very sad because I think beauty shouldn't be connected to uh, young and wrinkleless, and I also realized that I had the best conversation with those people because I had a lot of knowledge to share right. and that all like fusioned into the project that is called the beauty of age and I want to show through um, photos and videos and interviews all the things that we miss out if we don't look closely to the beauty and if we don't listen to the inner beauty they have. Right, wow, so do you have to kind of coax them into saying yes? I mean, I guess it will be kind of a challenge to find people who are willing to be like that much like examined, maybe all, mm -hmm. all like you could say. Um, but I, I think, I don't know, there's so many people out there who are in their eight, old age. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that they're also willing to share something of their knowledge with the, with the people out there, with the younger generations, who I think should know what age is like, what's the beauty of it. Yeah. Right, you can only come to know those things by getting older. Yeah. That's awesome. It's really beautiful work. And you said you're known for self-portraits, so this Normally. might be really interesting to kind of turn the camera outward. Definitely. Onto others. Awesome job. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Appreciate it. All Ooh, right. I give this to you. You pass it over <laughs> to Isabel. Welcome, Isabel. Hi. Thank you. Our first kind of graphic design kind yeah. of stuff going on. So what are you, you going to be working on for the next year? Uh, yeah, so I'm a designer and typographer. I'm based in the UK for the first time. So we're a bit of an experiment. Wow. Um, yeah, we have Europe over here. Yeah, we're, we're Europe. To US, US over here. Yeah. <laughs> so my background was in graphic design, mm. branding, art direction. But I realized that the thing I was really interested in was language so um, I've started doing some projects that are more to do with that so my project for the residency is called character character can mean a characteristic or it can refer to a letter in a font so for this project I want to look at why some typefaces feel German or English and also use design and typography to visualize those things that feel untranslatable yeah. and try and use it to kind of visualize these language and cultural things Wow, that's awesome. I, I love this exploration that started just graphic design and then kind of deconstructing and going deep down into it. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Thanks. Appreciate it. So we're going to, I'll actually take it because you are mic'd up. Thank you. Oh, I'll take this. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. This is Nadine. Yeah, hi. Welcome, I'm Nadine. I'm Nadine <laughs> and I'm more from the experimental side, but also illustration. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm interested in discovering paths of image making, which is not line based. And I want to take everyone on a tour, uh, which is called the Undrawn Drawing, which will be very experimental. There will be pixels and analog illustration combined, and also the community is uh, involved in that project. And um, if we take a look, I also like uh, to do walkable illustration, and so it might be a bit quirky, but very interesting. And yeah, I'm very excited I get the chance to do that here. Yeah. So yeah, quite All soon. Right. That's awesome. I love this idea of an experimental illustration, yeah. an experienced illustration. Right. Cool. Well, it created residence. You did very well. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm excited to see the work that you do you. in the next year. And we're going to take it over to the main stage. So see you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. A late fall or early winter day uh, when I was around five years old, um, I had gone with my mom, my brother, and some folks from my mom's church to uh, DC to feed the homeless. We brought huge things of chili and had bowls and served it out of the back of this van. You know, I was just five years old, but it left such a deep impression on me. The numbers of people, the sheer numbers of people that came up for food, um, how warm and gracious they were, uh, the connections that were made, even if really brief and fleeting, 
And I know that's a really small thing, right? We didn't change anybody's life with that. It was a small fix. And it was a kind of small effort on our part. But that was the first moment for me where I realized, hey, we can have an impact. We can make a change uh, with collective action. We can make an impact on others. So it's been many, many years. And still to this day, if like the temperature drops suddenly, like I think of that day. I think of um, those relationships, the people that we met. Have any of you had those types of moments that just kind of last? They stuck with you over time? A few people. So ask somebody who you think is really generous why they give, why they put their time out there. Um, and it's likely that you'll hear a somewhat selfish answer. Um, and I actually think that's OK. It's OK if they say, well, I, I give because it feels good to give. Um, so here's a, a quote that I like, a bit of an obligatory quote. But the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service of others. I think there are a few reasons that helping others and getting that selfish feeling out of it is actually a good thing for us and something that we need to embrace. Um, so I'm going to outline some like basic things. Hopefully these are pretty uh, uh, standard for you all. But the more we empathize, I think we actually find ourselves feeling like we're almost helping ourselves when we're helping somebody else. It feels great. There is often this perception that we're paying it back. Have you ever had the moment where you are um, primed with the opportunity to support somebody else, and it reminds you exactly of a time that somebody else helped you, and just felt like karma, right? I've got <laughs> I've got to do this thing. It's coming back around. There's also this idea that we can pay it forward. I've had moments where I see somebody and I'm like, if I can just help them, I because I can see myself potentially being there some point in the future or some, you know, distant reality. Um, I think it's also natural to kind of crave the feeling of having made an impact at all. That feeling of having made the smallest impact on somebody else in a world that we know kind of turns with or without us at the end of the day. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing things for others for a little bit of a selfish gain in the end. But I think there are two other really big reasons that we tend to forget that um, selfishness is actually kind of a good thing when it comes to helping others. Uh, and one of them is that it just feels good, like it actually, literally feels good to help others. Here's just a mood video for you. Um, <laughs> but helping others releases um, oxytocin in your body, which uh, is a chemical reaction that boosts your mood and counteracts um, the effects of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So helping others is actually a biological, feel-good thing that you can do. I'm going to break that down a little bit more with this next point. Um, one of the books I really liked is this one, Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect, written by um, a social cognitive neuroscientist, Matthew Lieberman. And he outlines that the need to connect, connect and support others is actually even more fundamental than our need for basic services, food and water. So it's kind of the principle or the foundational piece that, you know, forget Maslow's hierarchy of needs for a moment. It's that essential thing that everything's built on. He outlines that from the very moment that we're born, uh, we're immature compared to other mammals. We rely on somebody else to take care of us for uh, extended periods of time much unlike other mammals in, in the wild. It takes selfless love for us to even grow up and mature to become adults. So we each know that feeling of having been cared for and nurtured above most other mammals. On top of that, he shares that our brains are wired to use any and all free time that we have to process social relationships and dynamics, um, our relationships to other people. Um, so this book, Social, argues that our need to reach out to and connect with others is actually the primary driver between, behind most of our uh, actions and relationships. So I feel like that's pretty good news for us. <laughs> We're wired to help people. That's the case that I've made. Doing good feels good. Um, it triggers our biological reward system and makes us feel all happy and warm and fuzzy inside. 
So yeah, it's a little selfish to help people, but we should do it more. Now, I also think this is something that we can apply to our designs, our creative, the things that we output on a day-to-day -day basis, not just you know, the occasional thing that we do here or there in our lives. So I'll share an example from my time at the White House, but before I do that, I'll give a little bit more background on what I did there. So for the quick backgrounds, I was um, a, first an art director and then creative director and digital strategist for um, the Office of Digital Strategy in the Obama White House, where our mission was to connect people with purpose or to uh, find meaningful ways to engage the citizens and the administration, given the impact of technology on where you all get information and how you connect with one another. Of course, we're also there to help break down the sometimes complex policies of the administration into uh, relatable, plain language, simple, easy to understand content that was also engaging to kind of break through the cynicism of politics, um, which is even more uh, <laughs> rough these days. <laughs> so I was extremely lucky to have the opportunity to work for someone who believes that a hard work, a growth mindset, um, and the interest in helping others are really the foundations for uh, societal change. Uh, and this aligned with me and my values to such a high degree, I feel incredibly lucky. So anyways, I'm gonna share an example that actually predates me a bit from my time at the White House. Back before I joined the Obama White House in the Office of Digital Strategy, Caitlin Sabachek, Macon Phillips and a few others um, were in office that was then called the New Media Team and uh, got a little selfish for the American people. They remembered what it was like before they joined the White House when they were politically active and they spent time uh, putting together, pulling together petitions for the Bush administration to respond to. And they knew that petitioning the White House is actually a First Amendment right of all citizens. But the process that they went through was infuriating. It made, <laughs> it made them gather reams and reams of paper with signatures and either mail it in or slide it under the gates of the White House with no promise for getting a response and um, really no understanding of the process of what it was going through or whether it was going anywhere within uh, the offices inside. So they saw a really unique opportunity to get selfish and to create the thing that they wish they had, knowing that there was a use case for people of all political backgrounds since they had this use case. So they put a little time together um, uh, and they kind of channeled it on this issue and created We the People, the first digital means to petition the White House on any issue that matters to you, whether um, it's a kind of more personal local one or a large federal issue. And your political alignment, your residence, your citizenship didn't matter at all. It was an opportunity to level the playing field. If you got enough signatures in the platform, you would get a response from the White House. And sometimes it actually created policy. Uh, it launched in 2011. And what you're seeing here is a uh, kind of redesigned version that I had the opportunity to work on in 2016. But my theory is they got selfish in all the right ways when they put this together. They channeled something that was deeply wrong in the previous system. They knew that the system they were working in, the Obama administration, was very different from the Bush administration before it, but they saw the connected tissue and decided to do something about it. So you better believe it felt good, um, and they saw it pay off. By the time that I left the White House, this platform got over 5 million views uh, a month, uh, with huge spikes sometimes doubling or tripling that, depending on the petitions on the site. So I'll show a very different example. Here's just an animated GIF um, that it created around the Supreme Court decision to legalize gay marriage uh, in June 2015. So this animated gift just happens to be one of our most retweeted from at White House Twitter at the time and got over 64,000 retweets in, in no time. Uh, this avatar and, of course, the White House lit in rainbow colors and the 
um, time-lapse video that went with it, all went extremely viral, uh, all um, gaining more than 7.8 million views um, in no time at all. And of course we know right, why, right? This struck deep into something at the heart of um, American politics and our civil discourse. But what you might not know is that how this started wasn't some grand policy discussion inside the White House. It started with people getting just a little bit selfish, <laughs> just thinking, what are we missing? How can I connect my own passions where I stand as an individual and help make sure that people like me feel represented and feel connected to this administration and each other? So um, we decided that we were going to light the White House up in rainbow colors, change our avatars, do all of this work, regardless of which way the decision went in this kind of support fashion. I was lucky enough to be a part of this project. And I got the joy out of being able to support friends and seeing themselves represented at this huge federal level for the first time. Um, and even after uh, kind of going through this, actually, I'll, I'll pause for a moment. These are all just staff members. We couldn't really work <laughs> while it was lit up. Everybody just came out. Um, and something folks don't know is it was lit up all day long, starting in the morning. So you just didn't know every time a cloud would go over, we'd run out to see if the press noticed or <laughs> it was going to make news yet and nobody noticed me go back in. They must have thought, like, we're so weird. I mean, we were really weird, but <laughs> we're like, oh, I just keep going out and taking photos. Um, but this is an example, I think, of designers being selfish in some of the right ways, of policymakers being selfish in some of the right ways. Um, to help change culture and to help enforce um, uh, the changes that are happening in culture to, uh, to bolster them forward. This was kind of built on the work that was done by the Human Rights Campaign, by activists, by folks at um, ACLU, uh, that we were able to make this kind of positive change. So I would challenge you, obviously you're not going to light the White House up in any colors right now, but to... Um, change culture and to recognize that we have a place in that. And I'm actually not just flattering you, this like idea that designers, that creatives have an opportunity to change culture. I'm rallying you or attempting to rally you through my nervousness. Um, <laughs> is it working? <laughs> Smile, Ashley. <laughs> but I'm calling on you to dig deep into the things that bother you Dig deep into who you are, the things that keep you up at night. You're hurt about racial inequity. To use that, the fact that you were picked on in your childhood, to dig into those types of things. Um, your fear about being found out for being a little bit queer. Your uh, trouble with your family, not being able to see them across the border. The experiences that you have, um, just being homeless or hungry, the struggles that you have, the hopes to use them. Uh, every frustration, every fear, every hurt, hope that you've buried really deep down inside, thinking there's no way, there's no opportunity for this to change into something positive, I want us to pull that stuff back up and actually use it to create positive change, to get a little bit selfish. I don't think now is the time politically or socially to just coast on what's normal and what's expected. We need to push the boundaries and it means going someplace that is a little uncomfortable and vulnerable. I mean, you all see the world right now, see some of the things that are happening out there. We need to get some solutions going. I think the more you can identify and pull up an underlying thing that feels like it doesn't relate at all to your job as a designer, content strategist, marketer, coder, the more you can pull those types of things up and relate it back to your work, um, kind of consider it a part of what you're doing and address it, the better we'll all off be in the end. I'm really tired of designers being selfish in all the wrong ways, and I feel like I should definitely clarify that. You all know where I'm going with this? Have you... <laughs>
I'm tired of designers making apps just to remind people to tie their shoes. <laughs> that kind of thing. Tired of designers connecting salt shakers and condoms to the fucking internet of things. <laughs> it's like pretty terrible. <laughs> I think those are examples of designers being selfish and creative people being selfish in all the wrong ways. Focusing in way too narrowly on things that are right in front of us, things that you know, it's like, oh, I could make that better. The more we can dig in really, really deep and find these core things that bother us, the type of thing that um, you still think about a decade or two later, the better off we're going to be. So pull deep. Pull from what drives you and pull from what challenges you. And don't just be uh, selfish. Be selfish and scale it. I'll read the whole quote here. If you'd like to be selfish, you should do it in a very intelligent way. The stupid way to be selfish is the way we have always worked, seeking happiness for ourselves alone and, for, and in the process of becoming more and more miserable. The intelligent way to be selfish is to work for the welfare of others because doing so is intrinsically pleasurable. This idea that we get joy out of helping other people so why can't we put it into play in our work on a daily basis? Of course, consider whether the things that you're making, the things that you're digging deep into and pulling up, have the opportunity to hurt people. <laughs> Don't create those things. I recommend reading uh, Sarah Watcher, Botcher's book, Technically Wrong, if you haven't already. It's got wonderful tips on how to avoid exclusionary practices in tech spaces. And of course, talk to your customers, your constituents. Hear from them and try to consider every hope, fear that they have with as much importance as you consider your own. So this is just the 101 creative education talk that I feel like everybody should have been given, and I'm not sure that we were. It should be really simple, straightforward, and something that feels basic. If that's how it feels, then I'm actually very, very glad. It's not that complex. It's not that hard. It's just that we need to take a minute to talk about it and to go back to it and to focus on the real issues that matter, the things that matter to us really deeply and the ways that we can make impact for others. I'm really proud to currently work at Automatic, the tech company that, um, well, it does a lot, but in this instance, um, rebuilt, it gets better for free to help build a world where LGBTQ um, individuals are free to live equally and know how valuable and uh, worthy they are in society. I'm really thankful to work for a company where our software powers over 30% of the internet, but we manage that, WordPress, and do it very democratically with the entire global community, anybody who wants to contribute. Some that, somewhere that builds product, products to empower people to have financial freedom and to tell their own story their own way. We really try to do things differently. Um, pay attention to where social networks, media platforms, and employees are failing. And um, to learn from their mistakes and make changes that can, can scale for a better future. And who knows if it's going to work out at the end, right? But one of the things that I learned in the Obama White House that I'm trying to put into practice now is that you have to focus all of your efforts on what you're doing right now. Focus on the here and now and where you can make change. Of course, the White House assessors are you know, doing their own thing. I'm not sure they're making the positive change that I would have them do, but I still believe that there is hope for us to dig in and make positive change. So let's go out there and give everything we can to changing the world for the better, to challenging our perceptions. Let's allow ourselves to kind of feel good for helping others and helping ourselves. And as President Obama wrote, let's start the work right now. Thank you all very much. Let me know when, right? Hey everyone, welcome back for the last time 
to Adobe Live at the Adobe 99U conference. I'm just here closing it out for the week. This week we've been focusing on awesome creatives from all different spheres of influence, showing select talks from the main stage, and then we'll be back on Tuesday for a week of UX and UI design focusing on Adobe XD. So make sure you're back here, be.net slash live at 9 a.m. on Tuesday for a nice user experience surprise. So we will see you then. Have a great weekend. Hope you had fun at 99U and we will see you later. Bye. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Michelle! <laughs> <laughs>